The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to our webinar today. We're going to be talking about automating tax, excuse me, automating task compliance. I'm so excited. I can barely get my words out here. With Microsoft Dynamics Nav, uh, we're really excited to have Avalara here today presenting for us. Just a quick reminder before we get started, if you have any questions at any point, type them into that question box. I will call them out and get them answered. And also, of course, we always record all of our webinars. So this recording will be available later on this afternoon on our website, abc-computers.com. And without further ado, I will get it handed over to the Avalara team. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Automating Tax Compliance in Microsoft Dynamics Nav. I'm Laura Nofsky, Avalara Strategic Alliance Manager, and I work closely with ABC Computers. We're excited to partner with ABC Computers to bring you today's webinar and share how Avalara Tax makes tax less taxing and more relaxing. Now, without any further delay, I'd like to introduce today's presenter and Avalara's Regional Sales Manager, Matt Patrick. Having spent the last 10 years helping public accounting firms and corporations with automation solutions, Matt has an extensive background in tax technology, workflow, and business processes. Matt, the floor is all yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Abby, for having us uh, do our presentation today. So we are about to embark on the lovely conversation of sales and use tax compliance. I know we're all excited. And um, just to give everyone some context prior to uh, jumping into some things here, you know, oftentimes when we're doing these types of sessions, you you have folks coming from a different perspective that will end up, you know, either seeing the recording or, or being on our live call today. What I mean by that is, um, you know, we may have an IT professional that's been asked to come to learn more about why am I being asked to automate tax compliance? I'm not really sure what options are out there. We may have someone new to the role that uh, never really have done much sales tax compliance before. Uh, but it's been asked to really take that activity on at their company, or we could have seasoned vets that uh, certainly have been around for several years really in this space. So I hope to have some content for each of you. Um, certainly what I do encourage you, if you have specific questions, as you know, tax can be a very broad subject across a variety of industries. So I'd encourage you to reach out to us, and we can certainly have very specific conversations unique to what you do and what your activities are. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and uh, get started. You know, one of the things we like to do here at Avalara, we're, uh, we're, we're always like to look at trends of what's working out there, what's the overall message that we're seeing from our customers that we're working with. Um, for those not familiar with Avalara, we're, you know, we're a company that's really been around for 10 short years, and we continue to grow at uh, over 40% each year. So um, some of the things that you know, we want to learn about from customers is the same things that we, have, of course, apply uh, every day to our own business as, uh, as we do and would like to share to you. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as what we see in the marketplace. Uh, me personally, I get an opportunity to talk to controllers and CFOs every day, um, again, from a variety of industries. And, you know, some industries are performing differently than others. But I think on the whole, this the main message that we see is uh, the recession's over, right? And it's probably really been over for a couple of years now. And, you know, companies are really looking more and more at how are we growing the business, um, whereas, you, you know, even, I don't know, three, four years ago, it was how do we cut costs? It was always about cutting costs, right? And, it, and really the, the pendulum has fallen, swung into full swing around how do we grow the business and how do we scale it to uh, to the level that we want, right? So. As we know, every time you add to the business, you're concerned about well, what overhead comes along with it. Because obviously, if we're going to grow the business, but we need the overhead with it, we're not going to get any re, you know good margin to make it worth it. So businesses have constantly really been looking at the, that equation of how do we add to the top line without adding everything to the, the uh, you know to our cost with overhead or headcount, and a lot of that has to do with how more can we automate what we already do, right? And when we look at, and I ask controllers and CFOs, how many folks are you looking to hire in your department? And uh, many of them are saying, you know, we could hire three, but we're asking everyone to do the work of the three people we don't have. And we might hire one, um, but we just, you know, we're not going to get approval to hire 
the three that we'd like. And this is specific to tax and accounting. So oftentimes in this space, as we're you know talking in the context of sales and use tax, um, you know that's where the idea of you know what if I can pick up that additional 20 hours I may spend on this in a given month, I can reallocate that time to something more strategic to the business, and um, then move forward from there. And maybe I don't need um, a full-time person, or we can reduce when we need to bring that person on, et cetera. So those are again some of the core things that we're seeing. Creating visibility across the business, you know, what are we describing there? We continue to see businesses that have, um, you know, they're, they're adding more and more solutions that are part of their overall um, uh, IT stack and that both what supports the business but also interfaces with the customer. So um, what we're seeing is, you know, things in the tax world are, you know, certainly you can have everything from an e-commerce site to a mobile phone or mobile device as a field salesperson. Or uh, you know certainly in your back office with custom order entry or uh, standard order entry within NAV. So you know from a tax perspective, we're thinking of well, how do we bring all that together to make the same tax decisions um, in one place? Other examples that we see, and it, you, you've probably seen it in your business, is you know business intelligence continues to be a theme. So certainly bringing that information to to one place to make uh, uh, even more informed decisions that are data driven continue to be the trends out there. You know, again, as it relates to sales and use tax, um, you know, what's what's the message or the theme around it? You know, most CFOs look at it and go, you know, to be honest, it's not a it's not a strategic part of our business. We're not generating revenue by putting our time here. Um, you know, I could at least put 20 hours towards collecting money and making collection calls. I'd rather do that than collect money for the government. So it's time consuming. It can create risk if it's, um, you know, especially if you're in certain industries. But if you're not doing it correctly, it, obviously, it, it as anything compliance related, it does carry some risk involved. So um, there's a whole lot to there's not a whole lot to gain, and there's some to lose certainly with with managing this process. And that's why it's, um, automation has continued to be uh, certainly an option for for many companies over the past several years. So let's talk a little bit about what is driving that, right? What are the challenges that are driving the market to say, is this something that we want to maintain and continue to do in-house, or should we look at what are the tools out there to uh, to make our lives easier around sales tax compliance? You know, one of the first places when you think about what do I first do in a financial package to set up a new customer, right? I have to start thinking and asking and understanding those questions of is the customer taxable or not, and if they are, do I have nexus there, right? Um, and if I do, where are they located? Is it an origin-based state, a destination-based state? And then I may be looking at building a, a tax schedule that really represents a zip code, right? Because most of the free content we can get out there from a, a state website is really based on zip codes. And zip codes were built for the mail. It wasn't necessarily built for the tax boundaries that we see across the country. So a perfect example of that, and if you've seen an Avalara webinar before, you've probably seen this slide, because it just really does explain visually what to expect out there in, uh, with the different tax boundaries. But this is an example of the Denver market in Colorado. And if you're currently selling there, you're probably chuckling, right? Because you've experienced your, phone, your customers calling you and saying, um, look, you're, you're charging 8%. We're actually 4.5%. We're in... Uh, we're just across the street from that particular tax jurisdiction. Please, you know, resend us an invoice, right? And the reason for that is in in Colorado, it's a home rule state, and in one zip code, you might have five different taxing jurisdictions that really, again, can range from almost eight percent down to four, and uh, uh, you know, a little under four percent. And then, of course, each one of these jurisdictions has their own special taxing jurisdictions. And their own reporting requirements, meaning some of them are, um, you know, they want a paper return, and it's just sent really to that that local um, jurisdiction instead of the state. So zip codes are just uh, they're inaccurate. You know, when you think about automation, one of the things that most companies are looking at is I want to go to a place to define my tax policy. I don't want users to constantly have to make these decisions. So putting it again back into the real world, if you're you know a business that's that has 50 customers and you make 50 million a year on 50 customers, it's not a big deal because you're only dealing with this 50 times a year, right, on 
50, you know, on, on a sizable amount of revenue. However, if you're doing 50 million in sales or 10 million in sales or 5 million in sales, but you have thousands of customers and you have a footprint everywhere, as you can imagine, this, this challenge or problem becomes uh, quite substantially different for your business than the next. So that's what we're describing here. For those that aren't familiar with this type of context or, or environment is across the country, there's, I guess, over, it's safe to say over 11,000 different actual sales tax rates, right? And the products and services that you sell can really be taxed differently from state to state. And sometimes it's not even easy, even easy to see that, you know, a state calls the product or service the same thing state to state. So there's a, there's definitely complexity around these moving parts that we see here on the screen as the rates can change, the rules around the items and services can change, exemption for the customer's purpose can change or be different state to state. And then again, in some industries, as of we're, we're talking or doing this presentation in August, there's a lot of sales tax holidays coming up in different states for going back to school and other reasons. So there's... Um, there's a lot of moving parts, and you know, really, one of the areas just to kind of point out, and we'll kind of talk about product taxability in each one of these layers as we drill down into it. But what are we referring to as product taxability? So, you know, a, a common example that we might see in the grocery store is, and we don't even think about it, is I could go and pick up a Milky Way or uh, this dark Milky Way, and, and in each state, it's going to be, well, you know what? which one would be taxed uh, or not taxed. It's, it's kind of funny. One is non-taxable while the other one's taxable because this one has uh, flour and it's treated as food in many states, whereas the Milky Way is really candy and they're just taxing it, right? So there's a lot of different rules like this. And then with tax, it's never a definitive answer because it's still, with the exception of Washington, um, they're going to exempt both the candy and gum. So. You know, it's just the nuances around product taxability. Other examples are, I'm in the web-based software industry. If you're a customer buying our software in the state of Washington, you're going to get taxed at the full rate. If you're a customer in Texas, uh, you're going to be, I think it's 80% of the base rate. If you're in Virginia, it's going to be no tax at all. So um, there's many, many examples across several industries where your products and services can be taxed quite differently from, from each state. And what that means to you is you have to build either the internal resources or you go out to um, your local CPA firm or your current relationships and you say, hey, you know what, we're entering a new state. What does that mean from what we sell into that state and how it could be taxed differently? Other issues out there. So sometimes we see customers that are, uh, you know, they're, they're smaller businesses and then they, they, they change the way they go to market, right? And they start entering a lot of states quite quickly. And they didn't realize because everywhere they go, they, they really thought, because it is the case for the majority of the US, is the sourcing rules, meaning for those that don't know, what rate we attach to the transaction, is it where it's going or where it was started, right? So in most states, it's destination based, meaning where we're delivering the service or product to the customer is the rate we're assigning and associating for the jurisdiction for the tax. In some states, that's not always the case. If you're in Ohio and Tennessee and Virginia, uh, some of these states can really apply an origin-based destination or sourcing rule. Or in, in, to make it even worse, some states have different rules for services versus product, and we kind of refer to it as a mixed source state, just kind of depending on uh, the transaction itself. So the sourcing rules are an item or a level of detail that comes up. Now, for anyone that's really listening to this or, uh, you know, seeing this on, on a recording or on the phone today, if there's one thing I can always stress or what is the biggest risk with sales and use tax and some of the more challenging conversations we have with customers is when they call us and they say, yeah, you know, we, we got an audit notice from XYZ State and they're challenging the fact that we had, uh, we were delivering, you know, equipment there in that state using company-owned vehicles. And we've been doing that for the past eight, 10 years. We didn't realize that we created a footprint in that state and now we're liable for tax 
for all of those years. And of course, trying to get that back from your customers, mm, good luck. So the financial ramifications of not understanding where you have a footprint, where you have a responsibility to register, collect, and file um, can have some pretty significant issues to your business or risk. Uh, this also comes up for those that are looking at, you know what, I am a, I'm a private company. The owners of this business, I'm a CFO, I know that they're likely going to want to be looking at selling this business in the next five or ten years. Fast forward five or ten years later, if you had some pretty substantial negative audits related had an audit, but when they go through due diligence and they're looking at your business and they go, my gosh, you have a potential liability because we know you created Nexus in that state seven years ago, that's going to impact the, fin the actual sales price of the business when that your owner goes to exit the business. So there's this is a big area or a big topic for the states and for our customers uh, because the states are constantly looking at how do we expand our tax base and the tool they use is what are the activities that are coming from in the state and out of the state that can create a, a company for them to register, collect, and, and charge taxes in the state. So let's talk about exempt customers. You know, exempt customers, and typically what I see in, in division customers do within their financials is, you know, we use the standard fields to record that it's an exempt customer. We collect certificates in a variety of ways. Typically, we get them on email, sometimes fax, but either way, they either get printed out and put in a paper filing cabinet, or uh, they get put on a network drive, or they get attached in some way to the customer card, and I'll explain the downfall that you'll see on the last one. So for those that want to attach it to the customer card of Navision, it's convenient until it's the time of an audit. Because in our experience, when you go through an audit, and many of the customers that are attaching it in that way are typically businesses that are pretty non, most of their business is non-taxable. So, you know, out of 5 million in sales, 80% of it's non-taxable, and they attach these exemption certificates to it. So guess what? When the auditor comes in, where do they want to spend all of their time? Yes, they want you to, they want to see all those exemption certificates. And when you have it structured in that way, it's, it's, very time consuming to go back and actually uh, pick that up. So keep that in mind if you're on the phone and you're currently doing like that. You, you may want to create almost like a, a way to also put it on a, a network drive because it'll make your life a lot easier pulling certificates later. Um, but what you'll find out when you go through that auditor uh, audit if you're not currently doing this is different states have different expiration rules on the types of certificates that you collect and maintain. I would say more than 70% of the customers I talk to do not have a schedule that really tackles this problem. 30% that do, I think 95% of the time, they've done it with using Microsoft Excel. Okay, So if I had 500 certificates, they had an Excel spreadsheet representing those certificates and the rules on when they were collected and when they expire and when they need to go back and, and uh, recollect them. So as you can imagine, that's a burdensome process. We'll talk later about what tools are available to make that easier. Um, but just eh, describing a little bit of context of what we typically see out there in, uh, in the marketplace. So ERP and tax compliance, that's kind of what I was describing there on those, those two main items. You know, the moving parts related to rates, you're constantly building those and maintaining those different uh, zip codes or tax schedules within Navision. And when you go to update it month to month, they overwrite the previous month's rates, um, which means that if you need to reverse a transaction from a prior period, you may be using a different rate. So again, the, the more moving parts local, the more challenges you're likely to run into, um, you know, just dealing with compliance, assuming that you're in more than just one state uh, with sales and use tax compliance. So what do we see out there? I mean, what are the tangible costs that as you know, as you bring this up to those that make decisions, I mean, they have to look at it from the practical sense of how does this save time, money, or and or how does it change our risk profile related to this? It's also, I would say, even 30% of the time, folks are looking at this because they're just aggravated with the process around sales and use tax. 
Um, it's oftentimes the folks that they're hiring for these positions or that's doing the work uh, have the mentality of, you know, hey, they're going to either move out or move up in the business or, and take on additional responsibilities. So it's just, they're in this constant retraining mode. But either way, these are the main buckets of time that we typically see. And, and this data really comes from a, a research paper done by the Wakefield Research. And I'd be more, more than happy to send it out to you. It has a great deal of information as to how it comes up to these different buckets of time. But for those that do the work, I mean, you probably understand that you, you do spend time in these different areas each month, each year, uh, as you process sales and use tax returns. So I'm not going to describe each one, but these are the primary buckets for small and mid-sized businesses that um, you know certainly can take up your time. And then just to put that into financial terms, uh, the Wakefield Research Study did an average and this is typically what they saw in, in those areas or buckets. So a day in the life of the compliance manager, well, there's a lot going on at times. Yeah, try to read all those different activities. But I mean, the point of this is, did I just see Stir crying? Yeah. <laughs> it can be overwhelming especially if you haven't done this type of work in the past and you're at a business that's growing rapidly, entering new markets, it can be pretty challenging. And that's where Avalara can help. I mean, that's where really our growth as a business has really come from um, three things. One is we went to tackle the problem in a, a way that just makes sense for what the problem is. Um, and it's a growing problem for businesses. The states aren't getting easier. They're getting more aggressive and looking for and raising at their tax base. Um, and, and then as a business, they're looking to grow their business and certainly those activities are ending up creating additional responsibilities for them to collect, register, collect, and file taxes. So a little bit about Avalara, like what does our product actually do? Um, how does it work? So as Laura mentioned, I've been in the tax space for 10 years and I had kept a, an eye on Avalara, gosh, I think I first saw of, saw them at a trade show. If you ever saw us at a trade show, you'd, you'd understand why they would be noticed. Uh, they had a tiki booth and a long line to the margarita machine. And so, of course, I, I went home and I looked at, well, what do they do? So I kept an eye on them, and then three years ago I joined. And the reason why is, is to me, structurally what we're looking at. So when you think of this problem with sales and use tax, what are the, what's the known quantity? The rates are going to change. The taxability rules are going to change. They're different from each state. Boundaries can change. Reporting requirements, filing exemption certificates. All of the moving parts for tax compliance is really maintained in the cloud or on the web with Avalara. So a team of tax professionals are maintaining those moving parts while our system really creates a connection between your financials, Navision in this case, or an e-commerce site, or a point of sale system, or whatever it might be, right? Uh, to send data to our tax engine to then make a tax determination. So it's going to look at, Indivision's going to send us, uh, you know, things like customer number, customer origin, destination address, what's the products and services on the order, and then Avalara is going to look at that information and triangulate a tax decision and push that back into your quote ordering and invoicing process, right? And then we're going to capture those. So when you go to post those invoices, we're capturing those committed or final tra tax transactions so that we can organize that and then file it, uh, file a tax return on your behalf. So, you know, the business model is, is very much like a payroll type service, whereas, um, you know, it's really taking it from the front end of configuration and setup all the way through compliance and filing the tax returns. So we have different parts of the business. Uh, but I would say these three core levels of our product are, are really the core product that many of our customers use today. And, and it's really because it's just all the tools that you need to obviously fully automate sales and use tax. On the left-hand side, uh, I'll describe a little bit about Avalara's uh, Calc Engine. You know, this is a product that installs with Navision. It's, it's, it's a code merge between um, our product into that environment. But it's really a light footprint. And it's the component that's sending the data to our tax engine to make those tax decisions uh, work for you. And it's really the, 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 the brains behind the operations per se, right? So it's, it's going to do all the reporting. And then the exemption certificate product is really designed to help 
businesses um, do a much better job of electronically collecting certificates, storing them, applying them to the tax decision, and then providing you a lot of tools to really um, help you in the event of an audit that you can pull those certificates quite quickly. Returns, pretty self-explanatory. The data is already in the software. We put it into a format that's easy to reconcile and uh, approve the amounts that you want us to file on your behalf, and we take it over and file it on your behalf. So again, I just kind of, um, you know, as, as we go through, as reminders, that's what the calculation engine is really doing. The certificate wizard, um, it's pretty slick. You know, I, if you think of in real terms, um, you know, we have different folks that could be requesting certificates at different industries. You could have a salesperson, a customer service rep, et cetera, and they're not always really familiar with what a certificate might really look like or is it a valid certificate? So we have integration with Navision that you can directly from the customer card send an email that has a templated link. Um, when the customer clicks that link, it's gonna send them out to a web page that already has their information filled out, but they can select the certificate they need and sign it right on screen. So you're electronically capturing it and it's putting them on the correct certificate based on the questions that they answer. Kind of like a, almost like a TurboTax wizard based process. Tax returns, um, you know, really from a tax return standpoint, the way the process works is we ask customers to um, reconcile and, and approve the tax returns in our system to file by around the 10th of the month. And, um, and then we take that, you basically hand us the baton and then we go into your existing e-file structure uh, to fill out the tax returns and re remit payment. So we take one ACH debit out of your account and then we go in and, and can perform those activities. Once we're done, we post the final tax returns to the website and including our ACH payment schedules as well. So you have everything, your documentation for your records. But again, why do folks do it? It's always going back to the beginning. More and more folks continue to want to grow their business. It's a challenge in the tax and accounting department. They're looking at how do we free up time. This is just another area where there's an opportunity to free up time. Um, and it's certainly taking away something that can be aggravating to your business or just certainly isn't strategic or overall helping you grow revenue. So that's our commitment to you. We hopefully uh, covered some of the high level areas that you'd like to uh, learn about. And again, I would encourage you to reach out to uh, ABC Computers, myself directly, Laura on the phone. Um, there's a lot of questions that can come around tax and we can certainly help uh, guide you in the right direction. So again, thank you, ABC Computers. That will conclude today's call. Well, actually, let's open it up for any questions that may be out there. Okay, great. We do have a couple of questions. Do I have to change any of my current Microsoft processes to use Avalara? No. So the way Avalara works is you're really using I would say it would change a process of you no longer have to go out and research has a rate changed and then go into Navision and update that manually. So just to give you some context to the way Avalara is set up in Navision or really any financial product is you put Avatax as the tax schedule and that's going to take or that's telling Microsoft Navision to, to reach out to our cloud to make a tax determination. So you go from having hundreds to sometimes thousands of different tax schedules down to one and and then Avalara is really acting as your sub ledger going forward. Make sense? All right, awesome. Yeah, makes sense to me. Our next question, when taxability rules or tax boundaries change, do I need to do anything to update my tax schedules? No. So as things change, that's the beauty of Avatax. So as I had mentioned, you know, when I looked at Avalara initially, is they, the way they built the software is the right way to solve the problem because the more moving parts you have locally, it creates more challenges. Meaning in this situation, typically, as boundaries and things change, who, who's going to have to really go out and find that change occurred and updated within Navision? You are. With Avalara, when you're using Avatax as the tax schedule, all of the content that is the moving parts is now in the cloud in, in Avalara. So the rules around how tax applies to the customer, including its boundaries and or taxability rules that may or may not have changed, are being maintained by us and applied on the transaction being sent back to, to um, 
the vision. So we handle that on your behalf. And you wouldn't have to do that. Awesome. Okay. Well, if anyone has any further questions, feel free to type them in now. I will just remind everyone that, of course, we do record this webinar. So later on today, if you want anybody in your organization to see it or if you want to rewatch it, you will have access to it. It's going to be on abc-computers.com. And Matt, it looks like that is all the questions we had today. So thank you so much for that presentation. I know I learned a lot about it. So we're, we're pretty excited about this Avalara product, and I know our customers are too. Wonderful, and thanks again, Abby, for having us today. We appreciate it.